Well, let us uh, open with a word of prayer this morning. Good and most gracious God, once again we give you all thanks and praise for bringing us to a new day, for opening our eyes just to, to see the wonders of your creation, to take in that deep breath of air, Lord, just uh, reminding us of the life that we have within you. Uh, so Lord, uh, as we come here uh, today, Lord, we remember how it is that you have called us uh, to this place, uh, that you have joined us together as your people here, uh, that you have gifted us with many parts, as we talked about last week. Uh, many parts to accomplish the mission uh, that you have for us uh, here. Uh, so Lord, as we gather here and continue this, this Bible study, uh, helping us understand uh, how it is we begin focusing on the future that you have for us, we pray, Lord, that what you would do is you would bless this time together, uh, bless our hearts and bless our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, you guys all remembered your Bible study from last week, right? Yeah. All right. Who didn't remember it? I got copies. I got more copies. All right. All right. Hold on. Who needs a copy? Raise your hand if you need a copy. There you go. Anybody else need a copy? I've handed out a few of them, I know. All right, so we're good. All right, so if you remember, this Bible study comes from uh, the Senate. It's an LCMS missions uh, Bible study prepared by uh, um, uh, Reverend Dr. Mark Wood. Uh, he's, a, he's a second career pastor who in his first career did um, strategic planning um, in the secular world. So uh, so that's what he has done is he has adapted his program. He's adapted it for use in the church. Um, his program, again, is very similar to, to what I did. And I'm sort of wondering if maybe I used his program when I was, uh, when I was working in the secular world myself. Uh, that's, how, that's, how, that's how close it is. Um, and so we're going through the Bible study. Uh, once we finish the Bible study, as you know, I, I'll be out of town. Um, I'll be here next week, but then uh, Labor Day weekend I will not be here. Uh, that's when I'll be back east. Um, then I'll be back here for a week, and then I'll be gone uh, for a week to California. And so I figure what we'll do is we will start the other sessions, the, uh, the Saturday sessions, I'll start on the 23rd. I think that's a Saturday. Somebody can correct me if they got a calendar handy. Uh, but I think it's the 23rd of September. We'll start the Saturday sessions. What I'll probably do is uh, not this week, but maybe next week I'll put out like a sign up sheet. I'd like to know how many people are going to be here so we can make sure we set up and have the, the supplies for, for the right number of people. Uh, and again, I'd like to have as many people involved with this as we can as we put together the mission and vision because from the mission and vision, uh, I've been talking with uh, Reverend Key, who's our circuit visitor, who uh, I guess you would call him, I have like two ecclesial supervisors right now. He's the ecclesial supervisor for the circuit that, that Ascension is in, but I'm also reporting to President Maxwell and what I'm doing here. So we'll be talking with uh, President Maxwell, probably be looking for him uh, to be coming down here in, if all works well, I have to check with his calendar, in uh, the um, October time frame to talk to the congregation about establishment of a call committee and, uh, and and the different things that need to take place. So, anybody got a calendar? Am I right on the 23rd? Yes, it is. It is? Okay. I haven't totally lost my mind yet, so this is a good sign. Uh, so, last week um, we talked about God having a purpose for us and we talked about uh, the shape of the body, okay? Uh, shape of the body. 
So this week we uh, move into something that gets a little more theological here. We start talking about first article gifts. Now, don't worry about it if that's just a buzzword you hear in the church. We're going to describe what it is as we go through it. Now, once again, what I tried to do, and hopefully I didn't make any mistakes this, this week like I did last week. Um, I have put the readings there for you, so everybody is getting the same version of the reading. Uh, we're not reading out of, out of different, different Bible translations. Um, so we're all hearing the same thing. So we are on um, first article gifts, uh, uh, item number three in the Bible study. And so the way the Bible study works is he's given us some verbiage, all right? And then what he's done is he's asked us some questions to consider, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, let's read the first article gifts, section three, if we can read that and then stop there at 3A. Volunteer to read? Okay, Ron, go ahead. When we consider the shape of the body of our habitation in terms of the people who belong to it, the financial resources available today, our location, our community, the property we own, the equipment, and the other resources at our disposal, we're considering our first article of gifts. First article of gifts are the gifts that God has given to us that fall under the first article of the Apostles' Creed. They include everything that God has entrusted to us apart from the word and the These gifts are described in Martin Luther's explanation of the first part of the found in the small chapters. I agree to God, Father Almighty, Maker of heaven. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, and that He has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land and animals, and all I have. He richly and daily richly and daily provides me with all I need. To support this body of life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does out of thought, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and pray, serve and obey him. This is certainly true. Notice a variety of things that Luther includes in his list of God's first article of gifts. The list includes everything from our bodies to our clothing to sustenance to the people in our lives. As extensive as this list is, Luther shows the full extent of God's gracious freedom by summing up his first article of gifts as all that I need to support and describe in my life. The gifts that God gives to us individually and collectively are given for His purposes. We should find great joy in the gifts that we have been given and find a purpose for life in making good use of God's gifts, in response and love to the giver of these things and to share His love with their neighbors. But sin has a way of distorting our view of God's gifts. Rather than being elated over God's choice of gifts for us, we are often dissatisfied with God as a gift. Luther observed, This is a universal blame of our nature, that we are not satisfied with God's gifts, but abuse them and thus walk to the one another. The purpose for which God gives us good health, life, children, and property is not that we might offend the right hands of these gifts, but that we might recognize his mercy and give thanks to him. For this reason, he has given us the enjoyment and, as it were, the rule of almost all the creatures. But how few there are who do this? Do not almost all of us live in the most shocking abuse of the gifts of God? Perhaps the most shocking abuse of the gifts of God is our failure 
to make use of it to carry out its mission as a body of Christ in the place at the time and with the people of his choosing. Yet in most cases, this is more a matter of neglect or fear than of intentional abuse of God's grace. Strategic planning involves assessing the shape of the body, taking stocks of the gifts that God has given our congregation, and working together to understand and respond to God's purpose. Strategic planning is both a first cardinal gift and an effective way of making good use of first cardinal gifts. Like other first part of the gifts, strategic planning can be abused. But if we use it properly, I want to talk Nope, about you're almost done. End of this sentence. <laughs> but if we use it properly, strategic planning can help us carry out the work that God has entrusted to us. Okay. So, so when you think of these first article gifts, okay, um, one of the exercises that we're going to do when we get into the Saturday session is I'm going to want you guys to take stock of what are the first article gifts that we have here. And so just given the little definition that he's done, just to kind of give you a little primer for when we get together again to, to do the, uh, the, the actual Saturday sessions, what do you see here as first article gifts? What do you see? Well-being. Well-being. Well, we have a nice physical plant. You got a physical plant, okay. Well, most of the time. <laughs> when it's not leaking, it's not okay, leaking. nice physical plant. When it's not leaking, okay. If it doesn't rain, we have a good plant. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he's given us a nice facility. Okay, what else? We have music. We have music. We do worship, right? Yes. Nice place to worship, nice welcoming place to worship. What other kinds of things has he given us? Hard working people. What was the other one? Learn about God and increase our faith. Okay, so we have an opportunity to learn about God to increase our faith. Okay, what else? The opportunity to serve others by helping, like, as well as food bank or bringing stuff for the mission or yeah. opportunity to serve, that kind of thing. The opportunity to serve our community. He's blessed us with a preschool. Bless us with a preschool. Yes. Potential for outreach here. Has he blessed us financially? Yes. Okay, he's blessed us financially. Okay, we'll talk. We'll talk about that a little bit on Saturday. He's blessed us with the school skills to do the administrative functions, for example, all the bulletins, the newsletter, mm -hmm. yeah. all those things that sometimes they can take. Yeah, he's provided those parts of the body that that make up who we are as a congregation, right? To carry on the functions that need to take place in order for us to have a, a, I don't know, a smooth, you know, <clears throat> peaceful um, opportunity in, to, to praise God on Sunday morning. Well, actually during the week as well, okay? And so we see what's happened is we start, if we start taking a look at all of these things that God has gifted us with, you know, what this section is really dealing with is are we using them as good stewards? All right? Are we really using them as good stewards? And so we'll start going through the questions here and we'll see what happens. So question 3A is, according to Luther's explanation, why does God give us first article gifts? Why does God give us first article gifts in the first place? To further his kingdom? Said another way, or so it said the way Luther said it, for, for, for his purposes, right? For God's purposes for us in this place. Okay, that's why he's given us these gifts. All right? He doesn't give us these gifts so that we just exist. All right? Because if we just exist, what happens? What happens over time? We die. 
Okay, you guys who've been in Bible study with me all along know I use the phrase, a church turned in on itself that does not use these gifts. Another way of saying that, a church turned in on itself will die. Because why? They are not doing the mission that God has given them to do. Okay? And so God gives us these first article gifts for his purposes. Okay? For his purposes as the church. All right? So according to Luther's explanation, what are we to do with these first article gifts? Where does awareness come in that it is God that is the, the light? You, you lose that and you fail in applying them for his purpose. Mm -hmm. So somewhere you have to first become conscious of the fact that what you have Correct. is not yours or firm. It is. Yeah, and, and that really comes through in, in Luther's explanation of the first article. You know, what does this mean? You know, that God is God has given me my body, my ear, my eyes, my ears, my members. My reason, all my senses, he's given me clothing and shoes. You see, a lot of times, you know, for us, we don't even think twice. Thinking about the fact that we have shoes on our feet, that those are gifts from God. All right? A cre you know, it's, it's part of his creation. Now, you know, people say, okay, well, man created shoes. Well, think about it. Okay, I think I can tell this joke in here. <laughs> Just to help us understand, God and man are having this conversation, okay? And man says to God, hey God, we got this. We don't need you anymore. So God says, well, let's have a little contest. And so man says, okay. So God says, let us make another man. And God says, I'll go first, all right? So what God does is he takes the dust of the earth and he forms man, breathes life into him, and yes, there is man. So then he says to the man, he says, okay, now your turn. And so the man goes to get dust of the earth and God says, whoa, wait a minute. You gotta make your own dirt. <laughs> okay? There's a realization there that comes into being where we understand that everything that we have is that gift from God. Now, what he's talking about here is how do we use those gifts? Do we use those gifts for the benefit of his kingdom? Or do we use those benefits, those for the benefit of just ourselves? Okay? So, um, so, so, so that's the kind of thought that, that is trying to come through here. That we have to first recognize that everything we have is a gift of God. Okay? I don't know if I really truly answered your question there, Al. No, that's the point. Yeah. yeah. Everything, everything. Everything. Everything we have. And uh, I would even say, um, as we said in the prayer, thanking, <clears throat> thanking God for the gift of that first breath in the morning. That first breath in the morning is a gift of God. You take it for granted? Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. Okay. All right. So, according to Luther's explanation, what are we to do with these? These gifts were to use them. Use them how? For his kingdom. Yeah, for the good of his kingdom. We use these gifts that God has given us to his glory and, and his kingdom. Okay. Now, I don't know if I want to go there or not. <laughs> I think for now I will refrain. We'll probably talk about it in the Saturday session. But yeah, we use the things that we have. And of course, we do need to provide for ourselves, don't we? Yeah, we do. All right? But we also need to help provide for the good of God's kingdom. All right? 
that, you know, you see churches go through stewardship campaigns all the time, you know. Um, and why do they do that? Well, they're trying to remind people of this very thing, that everything they have is to the good of God's kingdom. But God wants us to use the gifts that he gives us, not just for our own well-being, but for the, but for the glory of God. I mean, we're talking everything we say, everything we do, everything we do interacting with one another is to the glory of God. Okay? You call somebody on the phone, right? Talk to them on the phone. You haven't seen them in church a while. You talk to them on the phone. What are you doing? You're telling them that you care. But, 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 what's, but what are you really doing? You are contacting them because you want out of concern. And you do that for the glory of God because you haven't seen them in church. Is there an issue, something that they need help with or something like that? You see, everything you're doing is to the glory of God, okay? For the good of his kingdom, all right? So of the first article gifts listed in Luther's explanation, which are related to strategic planning, do you think? Where he says, what does this mean? Which do you think are related to strategic planning? Probably all of them. Probably all of them. One way or another. One way or another. I would say that the aspect of defining the support the support of activities you do so that you can carry out one's mm -hmm. purpose with those gifts. With those gifts. Okay. What did you say? Well, he said that, you know, he's saying like, like all of them, because you use those gifts to carry out carry out what God wants us to do. And so, but when we think about strategic planning and we think about us sitting here today, and, and if I was to ask you, you know, uh, which we'll do during the Saturday sessions, but what is the vision God has for this church? Okay, I could probably go around the room and get uh, about a third more visions for this church and we have people here in the room okay and so we see we see what god has done he's given us our body our eyes our ears our members our reason our senses he's given us all these things he's given us this this ability for logic as his created creatures uh, to be able to discern um, the direction that god is leading us but at times we need to become more focused to be able to do that. Okay, so so yeah, I was right. It's like it's like all these things that God has given us really kind of come together um, in trying to involve ourselves in a strategic planning process. All right, that takes place. Um, now, a lot of times, what happens? I think I told you this last week is. Churches kind of get a little bit complacent. They like the way things are running. And, uh, and of course, you guys have heard me say this too, so I'm probably the worst the worst one here to say this, but you know, I, I tend to work on it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? Uh, however, you know, the other thing that we have to realize is that God continually wants us to move forward, uh, not just in our faith, grow in our faith, but to move forward in the ministry that he's given us here in this place. And what that does is a lot of times that invokes a word that just strikes fear in the heart of Lutherans. Change. change. <laughs> a lot of times that involves change. Because if we're going to move in a different direction, that means we are not doing things the same way that we've been doing them. Okay? But sometimes there's, there's something new that we're going to be infusing. Now, um, I will say that here, I'll say this uh, right now, that as a result of the strategic uh, planning process and the church becoming energized on their vision, that's when you see churches really start to break out and grow. Why? 
because the church recognizes it's moving in a specific direction. And everybody's focused on moving in that direction. And then they feel they have some ownership. And they feel they have some ownership. Okay, they feel they have some ownership. Okay, and that's important too. Now, one of the things that I'm going to talk about as we go through the Saturday sessions, I'm going to talk about consensus and what that means. Okay, because I'm trying to remember my presentation. I've got five levels of consensus that I want to talk about. And what I'm going to ask you guys to do is see where you fit individually on each one of those levels. Okay? And part of it is going to, part of it's going to involve that dreaded C word, okay? The dreaded word change. All right? And, and doing things like that. So, so we, will, we will get there. And so I think, you know, what Luther's talking about is he's made us who we are. He's, he's gifted us how he has gifted us so that we are able to go through this process and to try to discern uh, as a body, not as a single individual, but as a body where God is leading us. All right. That's important. That's important because then we're all moving in the same direction. OK. Yes, sir. Mm hmm. I was just thinking, um, another, not reason, but another uh, uh, need for uh, being open to change is that the gifts that you're given are not constant. It's not a one time thing, right. and there you have what you have, but rather those gifts keep changing, multiplying altering over time right and you've got to be uh, adapted uh, to those varying gifts in order to serve god's purpose effectively yeah and you know i, I mean as a second career pastor i spent a lot of time sitting you know in the pew watching pastor do his thing you know and i and, and i tell people if in the late 90s, if you had told me I was going to be a pastor, I would have told you to go jump in a lake. I said, nope, that is not going to happen. But then when you realize the gifts that God has given you and how he develops those gifts in you, they're changing over time. They are. And then how do we use those gifts that God has given you to the good of his kingdom? So, you know, I, I think what Al was saying here is, is totally right on point. That these gifts, as we join together, we hear the word of God proclaimed, and we, and we come to Bible study, and we, and, and we study the Bible on our own. We do all those things I tell you about Sunday after Sunday. <laughs> what God does is he changes your heart. All right? He grows you in your faith. He equips you to do certain things. Now, you know, we talked about last week, we said, well, you know, can the foot do, you know, what the arm does? Well, no. I guess the foot sometimes does what the mouth does, but... Uh... <laughs> Spends a little time there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, but that, you know, we realize we can't do everything. And that's, that's one of the big things I think a lot of people look at their pastor as, you know, this is the guy who's got to do it all. Okay? It doesn't happen that way. All right? Now, the pastor will help lead and guide and do those kinds of things, but he's not going to be able to do it all. Um, there's where you get pastors who try to do that, which I can tell you is detrimental to the health of the pastor and to the health of the congregation. All right? That is, that is, a, that is a, tough, a tough thing for a pastor to do. And what happens? The pastor burns out. And when the pastor burns out because he's got to do everything, I can tell you as a congregation, that's not a good thing. Your pastor will probably not stay if that happens. All right. And so that's why we're going through this process. Because as we look and we look at what part we play in, in the mission here of the church and we take ownership of what that mission is. All right. 
that that takes a lot of the burden off of it. Okay, a lot of burden off of the pastor, and, uh, and of course uh, the church emotions as a whole. Okay, so you can say something, DJ, or just getting ready to point a finger at me, or. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so three needs. So what proper use of strategic planning and what abuse of strategic planning are addressed in Proverbs 16, uh, 1 through 4 below? So 16, 1 through 4. I get somebody to read that. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from God. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Okay, so what's the proper use and what's the abuse of strategic planning here addressed? What do you think? Should be what is God's body. Okay. Commit your work to the Lord. Pray about it. Okay. Seek His, seek his guidance. How does that start to the plans? The plans of the heart belong to man. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What is that telling you? In your use of the tongue, what are you doing? You're, you're giving glory to God, right? You're giving glory to God in your use of the tongue. And so when you look at man's ways of glorifying God, you know, working or serving uh, the Lord, what is he doing? Seeking God's plan. Right? Seeking God's plan. Committing your plans to God. Okay? And I, and I would say that's the proper use. That everything we're doing, everything we're saying, every 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 time we're, we're, we're trying to discern whether God is leading us in this direction or not, you know, we're trying to discern collectively as the body of Christ as to whether or not this is the direction God is leading us. Proper use. What about an abuse? What would be abuse? I think the abuse would come in when when you want to have your way okay. and not be flexible with what brothers and sisters are discussing and right. you know, kind of digging in your heels. Yeah. Yeah. So you could say you could say an abuse would be man's selfish ways, okay? Uh, selfish plans, plans over God's plan. Okay, where you've got kind of stuck in your head, I don't care what everybody else thinks. This is what I think needs to be the direction that we go as, as a body. Now, man's ways are always turned inward and selfish. Okay, because what is man constantly seeking to do? To satisfy self. Okay, to satisfy self. All right, so working on, if you will, trying to improve themselves. There's my commercial for next hour. I can work that in. I can work that in. I think I can work that in. <laughs> so what this is, is, is like, Seeking your own ways. All right? And when you got individuals in the congregation that are deciding that their ways are more important than other people's ways, what does that cause? Conflict. Conflict. All right? Conflict. Winners and losers. Okay? Winners and losers. Winners and losers. Absolutely winners and losers. Okay? All right? So, so we understand a little bit that God has given us these first article gifts. He has, he has gifted us, I think, even beyond 
what we're recognizing here today. Because I think when we get into this exercise to identify these first article gifts that God has given us, I think we're going to find out that there are way more, way more gifts that God has given us than we think we have. Okay? And that's important. Other thoughts before we move on to uh, strategic planning as a first article gift? Providing focus. All right. I guess somebody go ahead and, and jump in on uh, number four. All right. Okay. First Corinthians 9, 24 to 26. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Running aimlessly, beating the air. These words picture, these word pictures describe how many congregations end up functioning. They don't mean to run around aimlessly, but that's what they end up doing. They are faithfully trying to do God's work, and they are very dedicated to the work that they are doing. But despite their good intentions, the congregation is struggling. The people lack the proper focus. Having a shared focus is important to any organization. Without one, people tend to go off and do whatever it is that they think is best, or whatever is most appealing to them. Things deteriorate to the situation described in Judges 21, Verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Strategic planning guides the congregation through a process that helps people understand and agree upon the congregation's focus. With a clear focus, people are able to work together toward a common goal. They can run together with a purpose. Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14 says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I impress on and make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All right, thank you. So, so you know, before we get in to the, to, to the questions, you know, I, I see in, in my previous two congregations that I was called to, this was the exact issue or, or thing that presented itself. Uh, there in Nebraska, uh, there were five major groups in the church, and all five thought they knew the way the congregation needed to go. So they were all going off in their own direction. All right, so part, part of what I had to do while I was there was try to pull them together and let's start moving in the same direction. Now, I was there for eight and a half years. It took five years to do that. It took five years to get them all going in the same direction. When I was in California, it was the same issue. I didn't have as many. I think I had four different factions, but they were all going off in a different direction. And that took me three years to get them going in the same direction like uh, as well. And so I'm not saying that as we go through this strategic planning process, that all of a sudden we're gonna throw a magic light switch and all of a sudden we're gonna be moving in the same direction. It's still gonna take time. As people get on board, as people uh, understand that they have ownership in the ministry that takes place here. And, and one of the things the pastor will do is the pastor will, he does more than just word and sacrament ministry. Those of you who've been around here during the week know that it's like busy like a beehive around here at times. Um, there's a lot of things, a lot of moving parts that are going on. And what the pastor will be doing is relying on people uh, to help, to help get those things accomplished. You know, so like for example, if we ask in worship, uh, what are the two things we've been? We've been asking for um, ushers and, and greeters. Well, we need altar guild. Okay, we got all these things. We need that help make 
the worship service just run very smooth. People come in. I mean, you know, Alvin wasn't here uh, last week, and everybody was concerned for Alvin. Why? He wasn't at the door. <laughs> All right. Alvin is taking that on as part of his ministry here. All right. I'm going to greet people at the door. You do a fine job at that, by the way. Yes. We'll have you do a training class someday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but 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 you see you see what it takes you know it takes all of us okay and so when you think about it in terms of that in what ways is our congregation running aimlessly what do you think in what way are we running aimlessly You don't think we're running aimlessly? You just mentioned three areas. Okay. I mean, no one's, people don't step up. Okay, and people don't step up. And volunteer. So serving, volunteering, okay. What you know, important one is no Sunday school, no for younger children. No Sunday school. You have to develop that. You'll have to keep all those in mind for the Saturday section, so I'm here to tell you, because those are important. Those are important right now, in this congregation, that's important. Because now we're starting to see people visit with children. We have people joining with children. Um, we need to start thinking about the future, okay, and where the congregation lean is. Now, here's kind of what I was thinking, okay, and this is just me, just based on cottage meetings and discussions that I've had with people, but, you know, I think the loss of people since the conflict has taken away much of the focus that we have as a congregation. Okay, I just think that's happened. Um, and the reason I say that is because it took too much away in the way of resources that we had in place to function. I mean, you lost a lot of leadership. You had, uh, you know, some of the boards and whatnot can't exist anymore. Uh, if you look at your constitution and bylaws, which I think when I was looking was somewhere around 33 pages, um, which is going to be somewhere around 11 when we get done with it, just so you know, a lot easier to read. But you didn't have enough people to fill all the positions that you had in your bylaws, okay? That's causing the congregation to run aimlessly, okay? And so, and so what happens is um, some of the things we used to do, we can't do until somebody steps up to the plate, right? Until somebody steps up to the plate. While, while things that we're doing are very intentional, they are, which is a good thing. I'm telling you that's a good thing, okay? Um, we have to make sure what we're doing is done with a ministry goal in mind. You gotta ask yourself the question, why are we doing this? When you talk about Sunday school, why are we doing this? Why do we need youth Sunday school? Why is that important? Okay, it's important because, you know, we are bringing up children, assisting parents and bringing their children up in the way of the Lord. And so in the meantime, what happens is we still do church, right? We still do church, but we have to do church with an eye on the future, okay? So when we think about wandering aimlessly, that's that ship without a rudder, that's what we're talking about. It's you know kind of like just existing without a real purpose behind it for a future, a real purpose for a future, okay? And so that's the kind of thing we're looking at. So, so as we understand kind of I think how we're functioning now, what is the focus of our congregational efforts right now? Keeping the doors open. Keeping the doors open. Okay, that's a, that, that's a very common response when we try to pull people together. You know, because people are not understanding what the vision God has for this church. So let's keep the doors open until we can figure it out. All right? While we try to defer, determine what God has placed on our hearts and the direction He wants to lead us, Let's at least keep the doors open and keep moving forward and keep trying to grow 
in our faith and our desire to, to be servants of the Lord in this place. And so I think God has um, uh, placed things on our heart, all right, to be accomplishing. But I think one of the, it's the resource limitations that keep us from going there, okay? Now, again, these are gonna come out in the Saturday sessions. But, 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 if, but, but if you look at the things that God has placed in our heart, what are some of the things you can think of that God has placed on the heart of this congregation? We've talked about, you know, the, the, the preschool and how we use the preschool. We've talked, uh, we've talked about potentially expanding the school. What else is out there? What else is out there for us? Of course, you have Bible study. What do you think else is out there? Well, small group Bible studies. Small group Bible studies. Okay, and I'll just say a note on that. Small groups, small group get-together, Bible study, as well as time of fellowship have gone a long way to grow churches. Okay, small group is really a support to growth of churches. You know, and so that would be another thing that might, keep that in mind when we do a Saturday session. You know, small group ministries. I think if you read my newsletter article, you saw that's one of the things I talked about. You know, maybe if you're thinking about trying to start a small group, small group Bible study. It doesn't have to be a lot of people. You know, maybe you just have a few people when you get together, you know, once a week or a couple times a month. You know, you get together, you, you're studying something, but you're also spending some time in fellowship, building relationship with one another. And you know what happens is that continues to solidify, then you, hey, hey, you know, I, I think I'll invite my neighbor to be part of this. Oh, there's that I word. That I word. Invite. <laughs> invite. I got to say it a third time. Invite. <laughs> All right. That, that you invite people to become part of who we are. Okay. So, so there's all this opportunity, uh, all this opportunity out there. All right. So, you guys have any thoughts on that? I, I mean, some of that's just my observation, but I wonder if you have thoughts. Well, I'm wondering what has happened to all the young <clears throat> couples with the children. Did they take it so for granted? What the gifts they have given? Um, why haven't they seen and brought up their children with the Lord? I mean, it's mm -hmm. such a it's such a void for them. Mm -hmm. um, and the youth groups and I mean, it's, I just don't know where all the young couples. I have a thought there. Does anybody else have an answer? We, I didn't hear. She says uh, she's concerned about the youth. Where have all the youth and the you know and, and the children got gone? Are they are they still being you know are they still growing in God's word? I guess and faith and whatnot. You know that there used to be used to be so many and now there's not very many some are and some aren't okay some are some are not still hearing the word the word of god there's no encouragement there okay so we don't have sunday school for the little ones anymore so of yeah. course they're probably going elsewhere to look for that yeah and and and, and that's what i was going to say is that you have uh families will be looking for and sometimes when they go to a church what do they offer for my children you know, do they offer Sunday school? Do they offer confirmation classes? Do they offer, you know, times where they get together and go off on activities and do things like that? Are they involved as part of the body of Christ? Um, VBS, okay, I'll throw that out there. VBS, does the church have a VBS? And, and guess what, you guys used to, right? and you don't now okay you know so here are these kinds of things is as you start thinking about one of those directions we want to go if it's out to youth what does that look like all right so be praying about that what does that look like all right and then how does that and what we are doing here and providing that how does that grow God's kingdom okay Again, these are the kind of things that we're going to go through in the Saturday morning sessions and have you guys come to some degree of consensus on. 
uh, as, as, as part of, of the future, the future of the congregation. And I will tell you, coming up with a vision is not a, and it happens, all right? Because you say, you know, we're here now, we want to get there. Now, what does it take for us to get there? That's part of the strategic planning process. Okay, how do we get from here to there? You don't just say, okay, we want to have all these things for youth, and then, and then it's like, well, okay, and then try to start, you know, uh, a youth uh, Bible study, uh, to start a youth group up again, to have VBS, to have, you know, all of these things for youth, you know, and just start them, because what's your, what's your limiting resource? What's that? Well, lack of kids, lack of but you got lack of volunteers. Yeah. All right, so what's the, what's the one thing you have to do? You have to develop those people within the congregation, you know, to help them to serve where God has given them a passion to serve. Okay, now I said it that way for a reason. You know, we don't just take a warm body and say, I need somebody to do VBS, so, so guess what? You got to do it. What if that's not your passion? Right. It's not going to work, is it? No. It's not going to be a very good program. All right. I'm going to steal a saying from Judy, which is the problem is too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Mm -hmm. Since everyone's making suggestions on what other people should be doing without stepping up and doing it themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think I, I think I told you guys before that, you know, it was always in the cottage meetings, it was someone has to do this, someone has to do that. And, and, and then I finally said, I think, I don't know, was it the third or the fourth uh, cottage meeting? They said, you know, I went back and I looked at the church roster and I didn't find anybody named someone. <laughs> All right. So. You know, and another thing, my other job that I come in contact with youth quite a bit, I'm at the museum. It's hard to get this next generation engaged in the conversation or make them want to be part of something. They, they have their own agenda or they're self-centered. Self mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's real hard to keep them engaged. And I think that's part of the problem. They would rather be on their cell phones. A lot of them. And you see them walking around on their cell phones. Even with one another, they're not talking to one another. Yeah. They're on their cell phones. Yeah. Sitting in a restaurant. Yeah. They always wonder, so are they talking to each other, sort of, on the phone? <laughs> well, I'm guilty of leaving my phone pretty much everywhere. Even the little kids are. Yeah. Okay. So, so what is the prize referenced in, in 1 Corinthians 9 and Philippians 3? What is the prize? The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what does that what does that really mean to you? What does this mean? Yeah. Famous Luther saying. Right. Also is this is most certainly true. <laughs> the prize is 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 really you know, we work to the best of our ability doing what God has for us to do in this place. All right? This is really doing the best that we can and doing all that we can to the glory of God. All right? And what that means is, again, get back to just maybe overusing the whole serving aspect. You know, we rely, uh, we rely on certain people just to step forward and do. Okay, that's what we do. We just rely on the same people over and over and over again. All right. We we, we call it the we call it the eighty twenty rule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you've got and actually it's ninety ten. Right. Yeah. Okay. Ninety ten. Ten percent of the people doing ninety percent of the effort that needs to take place. And what happens when you do that? Burn, burn, burn. You burn them out. Okay, they get tired as well. 
okay? And so this is why we, we do it as the whole body. So what prize should be the focus of our congregation's efforts? What prize? I think getting more people involved in Bible studies and <coughs> everything. So we can say one of one of the, the prize that we have is, is, is to be in a position to help the people here grow in their faith. Okay, all right. What does that mean if we're helping people grow in their faith? I'm sort of bringing this full circle. Okay. Are we circling the wagons? Helping our people grow in their faith? Or are we open to the unchurched? We can't hear you, Donna. So, I said, Sebastian, Sebastian has brought his friends. I just wonder what his friends have thought. Why? I'm not going to spot. That's the young spot. I'll tell you that the biggest community, church community that I see on the west side is Coronado Baptist. That's right. Yeah. Especially yeah. because I go to Franklin and Coronado. It's right in the middle of those, and they all swarm to that place because right. they have a very extensive youth program. Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying that. Uh, like with my experience, some of the kids aren't very, they don't really adhere to the word very much, but they're at least involved with the groups there. Um, and I mean, it's kind of an issue that you see, it's like majorly there's a decline in faith among young people already. And then it affects the United States as a society then more specifically us, right, in this area. Um, but the friends that I have invited, they come from Baptist backgrounds. Um, some of them, it's because their parents don't go anymore, so they don't go. Or uh, the one that I brought most recently, Connor, he just moved, so people are moving away and stuff like that. Um, they enjoy the service, they enjoy the traditional feel of it, but the one comment that they do make is that there's not young people there to keep it alive. You know, I guess it takes, you never know what, who's going to bring people in. And if you look at our history, there was one individual who announced baseball games at Franklin High School, who brought our mm -hmm. former DCE, who brought young people into the congregation. And who would think that somebody announcing baseball games would be an impetus to bring in a younger group? So, you know, it, and he was he would be at Franklin early in the morning by the flight pole offering prayer for those that wanted to join. And people really didn't know that. He did a lot. He did a lot behind the scenes that people don't know about. Okay. Well, is, it, is it back to the same thing what you've been telling tell us before? Invite, invite, invite. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say that, but then I thought, oh gosh, I'd be redundant. <laughs> okay. 
And, and you know, once you start developing and moving forward as a church body, um, you know, and taking ownership of the ministry that's taking place here, you know, part of it is not is not taking such ownership with it that you keep it to yourself. But, you know, what was it? Uh, too many chiefs, not enough Indians, okay? You need the Indians in order to develop so they can be chiefs, all right? And take over, take over the ministry and not just, not just, you know, have everybody think they, they know how to build a better wheel, okay? Um, it's just the way it works. Other thoughts? Well, gosh, we only got through two again. I think there's like nine in here. We're going to be at this a while. Um, but anyway, good discussion today. Uh, other thoughts before we close? Well, I, just, well, I think it's really, I get very distressed right, for the young people or whatever. I turned on my computer and MSN background said, recent studies show Jesus never lived. Or, you know, and then there's other things. That they don't have anything to go back to say, hey, it's documented even by Jewish scholars that he did live. I mean, there's all this stuff that the world is throwing at people. We, if we don't speak loudly, They've got nothing to say, hey, that's not true. Uh, I had a Bible study that I left in California, and for some reason nobody can find it. Uh, it was a Bible study done by Dr. Mayer, uh, and what he has done is he has taken um, history, and what history says, documented by such historians as Josephus, secular historians such as Josephus. He's married that up with archaeological finds uh, that they have found and are continuing to find. And he's marrying that out with what the scripture says. All right, and what, he is, what he's demonstrating here is what the Bible has said is true. All right. Um, you know, and so I think one of the things we suffer as a society is we suffer the impact of social media where, what, you know, it's a, what do they call it? Enlightenment, where truth is whatever I say the truth is. All right? So if you say the truth is something different, well, that's true, at least to you. So you can say, oh, yeah, Jesus never existed. That's truth to them. And what Dr. Mayer tries to do is say, let's look at truth and look at it with actual evidence. Okay, actual evidence. And you can't refute actual evidence. It's easy to say something like that, but it's really tough to back it up with facts. Okay? All right. Well, I went over. You guys give me a little grace today. <laughs> so let's rise and let's close with the Lord. So we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and then forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the highest kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, we'll see you in about 24 minutes. <coughs> Enjoy some more goodies over there.